Hey folks, it's Marvin Cash, the host of The Articulate Fly. On this episode, I'm joined by Tim Camisa of Trout and Feather. Tim shares his fly fishing and fly tying journey, and we have a chance to discuss Tim's new book, Fly Tying for Everyone. I think you're really going to enjoy this interview. But before we get to the interview, just a couple of housekeeping items. If you like the podcast, please tell a friend and please subscribe and leave us a rating and review in the podcatcher of your choice. It really helps us out. And as we continue to create and distribute more diverse content, you may want to consider downloading our iOS or our Android app. We organize our content by category so you can go straight to the content that interests you the most. The apps are free and the links are in the show notes. Alternatively, just search the Articulate Fly where you get your mobile apps. Now, on to the interview. Well, Tim, welcome to the Articulate Fly. Thanks, Marvin. It's great to be here. And, and just so everybody knows, not only am I like so excited to be a guest on the Articulated Fly, but I'm also a listener. It's been great to kind of listen to your updates. I love when you have certain guests on, uh, you know, especially when you give stream updates all around the East Coast. Uh, so what you're doing has been awesome, Marvin. Thank you so much. Oh, I super appreciate that. And it's it's fun to uh, to watch watch your stuff on the internet. And it's also fun to bump into you and actually talk to you in person. And uh, looking forward to doing some of that in this new post-COVID world, knock on wood. Oh, soon enough, soon enough. I'm, I'm hoping to maybe see you at the International Fly Tying Symposium, because I know we've connected there before. Do you plan on being there too? Yeah, that's my that's my plan. And I may actually, as opposed to flying up for the day, I may actually um, fly up and uh, spend the night and stay for the banquet since it's the 30th year. Oh, awesome. Yeah, it's going to be a great banquet. I mean, the, the whole experience there, it's such an awesome fly tying community. And that's kind of the, the big event, at least in my mind, that pulls everyone together. Like you said, Chuck Bermski is holding the 30th anniversary. Let's just, you know, knock on what everything's safe. We can have just a fantastic symposium and just see a bunch of incredible tires just sharing their creations with everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things, since you're a, a longtime listener, you know, is we have a tradition. We always ask our guests to share their earliest fishing memory. Well, let me jump right into that. So I, I don't want to disappoint your listeners. It's not fly fishing, but I was a fisherman-ish. I'll say I, I love to fish at times, but my, my father, you know, he always was and still is, just an early riser. And when I was younger, that was not my thing. Now, as an adult, I, you know, I wake up every morning around 4.30, 5 o'clock, just, and I'm ready to go. But at that point, gosh, I was around eight or nine years old. It was the first day of trout. And this is like a ritual in Pennsylvania, which is where I'm from. And my dad woke us up as early as I can remember. We drove to his favorite trout stream. And then not only did we hike up that trout stream, but he wanted to go up this tributary as well, because he felt that that's where the fish were going to be. And and I can remember just trotting up through the water. You know, it's really cold. I'm tired. And eventually he set me down on this log. And I'm sitting on this log, just waiting for the opening bell in a sense, because whatever time you're allowed to start fishing, that's the that's when you can make your first cast. And, you know, my dad was just really chomping at the bit. I was just kind of there. You know, I was along for the ride. I was going to fish. But I just remember being on this log, and I made the big mistake of staring into the water. And it was so cool because it was just like looking into this aquarium and I could see everything going on, these little insects, the water rushing by, you know, just, it, it was so fascinating. But then it was also really kind of, I don't want to say captivating, but in a sense that it started to make me very drowsy. And after about five minutes of staring into the water, um, I was now drinking the water because I fell right in. This was before the start of the season. My dad was furious because here I am, this little boy first day, you know, spring, early spring, a really cold day, and I'm dripping wet. So you can imagine what we had to do. Onto his shoulders I went, and we trudged back to the vehicle because I we had to change clothes and I had to warm up. So we missed opening moments of that first day of trout fishing in Pennsylvania. Thank goodness that has not happened since. But that's, that's the first memory, I, you know, I can really just grab a hold of, of Marvin. Yeah, very neat. And so uh, when did you get pulled to the dark side of fly fishing? Gosh, I would say what's interesting, unlike a lot of people, for me, fly fishing didn't come first. It was fly time. When I was around 10 years old, uh, my parents enrolled me in this after school program with um, a, a couple individuals that taught us how to tie flies. Um, it was so cool because it wasn't about like catching fish. It was just about making these creations onto a hook. And I just fell in love with it. Um, I was captivated by it. My uncle John, he actually came and he helped out and I found out. He was really big into fly tying and fly fishing. So 
But it was weird because we were making all these creations. And I'm sure they explained it at the time. But for the first two or three months, it was just all about the time. And I never put two and two together that we were going to actually use those to catch fish. So unlike so many others, the time came first, like literally. And then a few months later, once I was able to start to put everything together, then I realized, oh, fly fishing is a part of this thing too. Tell me more about it. And I, then I started down that really terrible pathway, as all of you know. I mean, that, that time for me was the gateway drug that just trapped me. <laughs> it, was the, it was the marijuana of fly fishing for you. <laughs> correct. <laughs> so, so you, you know, you've been around the sport for, you know, probably, I think you've tied, been tying for 30 years and probably been fly fishing that long. Who are some of the folks that have mentored you on your fly fishing journey? Oh gosh, I've been very fortunate. I, I think I've already mentioned my father. He likes to fly fish. It's not a passion like it is for me, but it's been great to have my dad there. He's been just such a strong supporter of everything along the way. And he's given me so much advice for my YouTube channel and just, you know, everything in general. So he was kind of that start. I mentioned my Uncle John. Uh, my Uncle John just turned 90 recently, and he's been featured on my, my channel multiple times. He's a really traditionalist. I mean, he doesn't believe in strike indicators. He wants you to only use you know fur and feathers on your hooks. I mean, he's that type of an individual. And um, gosh, he, has been, he was such a strong mentor early on. From that point, I had really two more that just kind of really pulled me to, to that next level. And that's kind of how I look at my mentors. Each mentor kind of got me to that next stage. And that next mentor is a gentleman by the name of John Dunn. And he was the one who kind of pulled me to say that fly fishing, though it exists in West, Western Pennsylvania and some of these delayed harvest areas, it's more than that. And he started kind of pulling me to central Pennsylvania. He pulled me all the way to Montana, to the you know East Coast. And, and he really kind of brought me out of my shell and introduced me to so many other areas of fly fishing and fly time because he was just an exceptional tire. He still is. And he's just really very minute with everything he does. And, and he taught me so much. But then most recently, I think I mentioned this individual as well, was Chuck Frimsky. He's the individual that started the fly fishing show before turning it over to his son, Ben. And uh, Chuck and I had a, a connection because a number of years ago, maybe five or six years ago, he invited me to tie at the International Fly Tying Symposium. And to be invited was, was such an honor, but I had an obligation. So I had to turn him down. And I felt so just awkward having to call Chuck Frimsky back and turn him down. But I did. And I think that upset him because he doesn't get turned down very often. So he kind of called me back the next year and we emailed back and forth. And he said, hey, can you do it again? And he made this joke like, I only asked twice. Like, you, you better not say no again. And I, I was like, absolutely. I was just so, you know, in, you know just uh, above the world to be invited to that symposium. And it was really cool because I got a chance to know Chuck a little bit there. But whenever he's at the show, he is just moving and introducing speakers and making sure everything's the way it should be. And you don't have a lot of time to, to talk to him there. So I don't feel that a lot of people really know Chuck Brinsky. But then he has this other event called the Fly Tires Reunion. It's held in Seven Springs in Pennsylvania uh, once a year. We're planning on having it this fall, maybe a private event. We're not quite sure yet. But at that event, it's a little bit more low key. It's a free event for everyone to come. And he brings in a bunch of tires and it's kind of a celebration of the year. And I had a chance then to spend more time with him, to start fishing with him, to see that he's an exceptional tire. And we develop a friendship. Um, we talk on the phone, I don't know, two or three times a week. We fish together as much as possible, even though he lives over in Ocean City, New Jersey now. But I mean, any chance we have to hang out, we do it. And whenever I, you ask the question about the mentor, he's that person that Whenever I'm stuck, whenever I'm not quite sure what to do with my book or with the website or with this component, he really can pull that side in and really help me out. But then it's great because we'll be talking about that. We can just switch gears and go right into fly time and you know start arguing back and forth about why this articulated streamer wild fish this other one. So he's that kind of current mentor that's really helped to pull everything together. Yeah, it's super neat. And, you know, kind of younger people know him from the show, but, you know, some of you know, I'm older than you are, uh, you know, I can remember, you know, when he was, you know, writing articles in fly tire, right. And they're, you know, and still remember, you know, his patterns being picked, you know, when they were picked up, uh, by, you know, fly companies. Absolutely. And he had some really creative patterns. I mean, I think he was known more so for his, his leather and he has all these crazy flies that really helped to, to showcase that I've had him tie a couple of his patterns on my channel and there's a couple more that we kind of have in the wings that we just have to finish. We started the video and, and we have a few more 
parts of the flood to go through. But man, whenever you see him tie, I mean, he is very intentional in everything that he does. He's very precise and, and he has just an incredible finished product to this day. So I'm, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky to have him, you know, to call him a friend and a mentor. Yeah, very neat. And kind of coming back to, uh, you know, 10 years old in your after school program, you know, what was your, <laughs> what was your first vice and what was the first fly that you tied on it? Even if you didn't know it was a fly at the time. Yeah. Well, my first vice, I actually made a video about this one because I love fly tying vices and I have way too many to count right now. But my first vice was a hand me down. I, I don't know the exact name of it. It was a fixed vice. It had this, at, at the time, it was this ugly green piece of metal that kind of held it. It was a C clamp. Um, gosh, it, it barely held a hook, but it did. And probably like so many others, I was just, I, I looked at it and I was like, ah, can you really? Like, I'm 10 years old, but you got to give me something nicer than this. And it was just almost disappointing at the time. But the vice was a hand me down. It had been tied on by so many individuals, and I didn't appreciate that at the time. And thank goodness I've held on to that vice all these years because I love it. And I still will pull it out and tie a couple of flies on it every year, though I'm happy to kind of put it in the back of the, the you know the shelf afterwards and pull out my new ones. And the first fly, Marvin, I, I thought I've, I've really thought about this. I have a number of my first series of flies that I tied from that class when I was 10. I don't know which one was the first one, but I can tell you the one that I love, the one that really brought me into that class was when we had the chance to spin deer hair. And there was something just so fascinating about putting on these pieces of deer belly hair, wrapping thread around it, pulling tight, and it just spun and went crazy. And we packed it and we cut it and made these cool creations like mouse patterns and these poppers. And then you stand up and there was just deer hair all over the place and, and no one was yelling at you to clean it up. That was the, that was really what pulled me back, just seeing those really cool deer hair creations. Yeah, you can get in a lot of trouble uh, at home if you don't get the deer yeah. hair picked up. <laughs> oh, without a doubt. I mean, I feel bad. I have a one-year-old daughter, and my wife is always on me saying, you have to get all of these materials out of here. She can, she can put this stuff in her mouth. And I'm like, I know, I know. But, I, you know, i got to get rubber legs on this cicada pattern. Come on. Yeah, there you go. And, and so, you know, it's interesting, right? Because, uh, you know, fly tying is so collaborative, and it's always interesting to talk to tires because I always like to – you know, hear about who they watch and why they watch, watch them and how they influence each other. Oh, without a doubt. I, well, what's really cool. And, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about this throughout the, this podcast as a fly tire. And I know you've been in this game as well for, for, you know, X amount of years. And can you imagine 30 years ago? I mean, I got into this a little bit over 30 years ago. The information that was out there was so tough to come by. And now, there's so much of it and there's so many tires that are willing to share like the keys to the kingdom with you. And that's the part that is just absolutely wild that you have access, you know, via social media. to so, so many of these tires that are like at the top of the game right now. I mean, the ones that I love to follow and I'll give you some reasons for them. I mean, in my mind, one of the best is Tim Flagler. He has such great informational videos. He just has a sense of the vice. He knows what he's doing. He speaks with confidence. And it's why I catch fish, which I think is the theme for all these, my, my favorite tires. They all have patterns that catch fish. Um, there's a younger tire out there that I think is doing really phenomenal stuff. His name is Gunnar Bramer. He, his patterns are really wild. They're for larger fish. They're not just for trout. In fact, uh, every time he and I are talking on the phone, he kind of gets the kick out of it that he has so many YouTube subscribers that are more trout fishers than, we'll say, pike or muskie, those big fish that he loves to chase. He gets a real big kick out of that because to him, it's just, oh, that's a small trout you're after. Like, I'm after the big boys. But some of the, the, the patterns he's coming up with right now are just really cool because he's tying these large patterns that can shed water. They're easier to cast, that type of stuff. So I love to see his, his current stuff. Um, uh, I guess a fellow Pennsylvania fly tire and fly fisher that you know really is at the top of my list is George Daniel. He was a member of Fly Fishing Team USA. Um, you know, he's in my home state. He's He's coached the youth fly fishing team, USA team. He's now one of the instructors at Penn State University for their fly fishing class. And you never know what he's going to come up with or share next. He's got a YouTube channel and he just, you know, he's very free with information. So he's another one that's at the top of my list. I'll shout out a couple other quick names. I don't want to bore your listeners, but for anyone who's you know taking notes, um, some younger tires that really, I don't know, they blow me away. 
especially on Instagram, Justin Aldrich is one. He is really known for his Euro nymphs and his jig nymphs. Um, he, he ties these jig streamers that are phenomenal. I actually cited him in my book because he, he just does some really great stuff. There's another person, their tire, his name is Justin Bruce. Uh, he ties this really cool thing called the Houdini weave with wire. So I follow Justin. Nicole March is another phenomenal tire. Her, um, her work with peacock quills is just phenomenal. I mean, I kind of referenced her multiple times um, on a number of articles that I've written. There's somebody else, I can't remember what, what country he's from, but his name is Evgeny Borovin, spelled B-O-R-O-V-I-N. And he ties these, like, imagine a cat skill dry fly, but he also weaves in maybe a piece of partridge kind of in between or in front of the hackle. So you have this fly that has really straight lines, but it has this beautiful uh, Hungarian partridge uh, feather weaved within it. Just those fibers kind of going all over the place. It, he, he just has just something to his patterns that what, what's unique about him compared to so many others. When I see one of his flies, like I know immediately it's one of his. And I think of all the tires that I've mentioned. I have a couple more. He's the one that I click the save button on Instagram more than others. I just, I, I'm blown away by his pattern. Uh, Devin Olson, he's another person that he, you know, he's kind of another mentor to me. I, I talk to him as much as I can, uh, but his flies are very functional. They catch fish, um, and he's very thorough when he explains them. And I, I think the, the last individual that I'll mention as of right now would be Phil Raleigh. Uh, Phil's been another mentor from, of mine. He's known mainly for still water applications, but he's a phenomenal tire. <laughs> he's excellent. I mean, he lives up in Canada, and, and I always look forward to hanging out with him at the symposium, too. So, that's a, a few of my lists. I, have, I can come up with another half a dozen if you want, but we can be here all night talking about others and just the notion of collaborating and, and following them and, and being inspired by these people. Yeah, absolutely. And it's super helpful, too, because kind of the, the curse of social media is there's no curation, right? So, you know, you can kind of lose your mind trying to kind of find um, the needle in the haystack. So it's super helpful that you've kind of given folks, I don't know, six or eight names if they're not familiar with these folks to go look, check them out on social media and um, know that they have the goods for lack of a better word. They definitely do. Absolutely. And if, 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 if they didn't hear me say them properly, tell them to reach out, you know, anyone listening, reach out to me and I can give you a, a comprehensive list of those that I follow, which the downside of this and, and Marvin, I, I'm sure, I think you kind of hit on it. There's so much content out there that I'm telling you about these, you know, five, six, eight, twelve 12 people that I follow, but you can't keep up to date with everybody. And that's the tricky part. Even those ones, I know I'm missing stuff with them because it's, it's you know social media is such a beast right now, and that content just keeps coming out that it's it's easy to miss information from these individuals and others. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, one thing I always like to do, Tim, you know, when I have uh, tires, you know, whether they're you know. You know, you're not a production tire, but, you know, you're not just a dude sitting at home tying flies either. Um, as I always l ask uh, folks like you to share, you know, two or three tips that mere mortals like me and other tires can use uh, to up their game. Well, first of all, I'm a mortal, too. So just because I got a book out and a little YouTube channel, that that doesn't put me at that that top echelon. I love to tie. And, and whenever I tell people I've tied for 30 years, that doesn't mean I've been tying professionally for 30 years. I've just... I've tied for over 30 years. So I'll give you some tips, though. I will tell you a few tips based on what I've learned over the years and what kind of helps me move forward. Number one, whenever you're tying patterns, the first thing that I really recommend to others, when you tie X pattern and you tie a second one of X pattern, compare the two. They should look identical or nearly identical. If not, you have to say to yourself, something went wrong. And it, it typically all comes down to proportions or material selection. So whenever you're selecting material, cutting a material, um, selecting a hackle, um, cutting deer hair, or, or whatever, you have to really find a way to reference it. So, so whatever you did on the first pattern, you'll make those same operations on the second pattern and every pattern thereafter. So in my mind, whenever I have a, a fly that I really love, if I just tie that pair to gone and this one looks just smoking off of life, I'm going to set it aside and I'm going to look at it and constantly be using that to compare it to the other, the other flies that are coming off my bike. I mean, I, if you look in my box of Euronyms, every tail is nearly identical going down a row. If I have three rows of size 16, unless there's something I'm doing, you know, unique with a few of them, all the other ones, the tips should be all the same length going down that row because I know what I use 
you know, to guide my proportions for a tail. So that's what I, that would be kind of tip number one. Really make sure your pattern book as close as possible to ensure proportions, which leads into tip number two. Be generous with your razor blade. And what I mean by that, when you tie something that doesn't look quite right, grab that razor blade and cut everything off a hook. Just cut it off the hook. Um, I know many people say, well, hey, come on, Tim. Ugly flies catch fish too. It, in my mind, they don't catch me. And what happens whenever I put those, I don't want to say ugly flies, but a fly that just wasn't up to that highest quality. When I put it in my box and I'm on the water and I go to select a pattern, that pattern that just doesn't look quite right to me, I probably won't put on my, my tippet. And when it does make it on there, I'm probably not going to have as much confidence in that fly as I would another. And I probably won't fish it to whatever degree it deserves. And knowing that I may not do that, it's probably not going to catch any fish. It's going to go back in my box, and it's, we're just going to have a terrible cycle with those flies versus just not putting it in there in the first place. I mean, like so many others, I had to learn that the hard way where I would tie flies that probably weren't my best when I was younger. But it was a fly. It was finished. Uh, I could kind of get my tippet through the eye, and it went in my box. And that was the biggest mistake I, I, I really made. So that would be tip number two. And then tip number three, I know you and I have kind of done our best to, we haven't jumped fully into social media yet, but I really tell people, let your experiences on the water dictate what you're tying, not outside factors like social media. Now, there are times where I'm on Instagram, I'm on even TikTok, we're looking at fly patterns on YouTube, and I see a fly that just looks really cool. I want to tie it. I'm not sure what situation I'm going to use it in, but it just it, it intrigues me. It, it inspires me. There's something about it that's just, it's cool. It's got the cool factor. I want to tie it. But then there's other times where you'll hear people on social media or you'll read about it in a magazine article. This is the fly that you have to have. And it might be a great fly for that person on that water type in that situation, but that probably isn't your situation, your water type at that moment for you. So, Whenever you're at your vice and you go to tie some flies, really just take a second to think about things. Say to yourself, what worked today? What worked in the last week? What worked in the last month on my water? What's probably going to work in the next three weeks, in the next month? If you're tying over the winter, think about those first flies you're going to need in the spring. And I would really just, uh, and maybe I'm more of a functional fly tire, but I really try my best not to let those outside factors influence my time. I really think about my time on the water the water color, you know, if it's a greener water color, then I'm going to have more green in my flies just to match those nymphs that are in that water. But I really let my, all of my experience on the water dictate what I'm tying, not just because this person said on social media that it, it caught fish for him or her that day, when in reality, that person probably wasn't even fishing that day. So, you know, be careful what, what you see and what you hear on social media, because it's not always true. Yeah. And I, I think that's great general advice for fishing in general. Cause I, you know, my kind of my general observation is, you know, we need to work harder to understand why we're doing what we're doing. And we'd have to remember a whole lot less stuff to fish successfully. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. Well said, Marvin. Yeah. It's um, so, I mean, I, that really, uh, really resonates with me. And, you know, another thing we always ask tires when we get them on the podcast is we, we always want to hear about the, uh, the squirreliest tool that they use that they can't live without. Gosh, you know what you, and for the listeners out there, I got to tell you, I have to kind of pause everything because Marvin is so thorough that he gives us a lot of these questions ahead of time. And, and he, Marvin, you do an excellent job with this podcast. So I'm looking over this question and it really bugged me. And I actually went through my fly time drawer and I was trying to pull out things that I thought were kind of out there. And, and I have a tool that's kind of out there, but it's nothing I could live without. So I decided I'm going to flip the question because unlike a lot of your listeners who tie flies, there are two tools that I don't live with that probably everybody out there does. And the two tools I don't use are a whip finisher and a threader for your bobbin. I don't use them. I use a hand whip finish. And for any of your listeners that do that, awesome. I feel like it's a brotherhood of, of those of us who just <laughs> use our hands and not the whip finisher. I, I'm terrible. I mean, I, when I, if I have to show somebody how to use it, I have to kind of think to myself, how do I use this again? I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's how I use it. Because I, I literally never use them. And when it comes to a threader, there was this fly tire in Pennsylvania years ago. He actually, I believe he taught the Penn State course back in maybe the 50s or 60s. His name was George Harvey. And whenever he would thread his bobbin, he would always stick his thread up through the bottom of the nozzle, 
been stuck on the tip to suck his thread through. And he must have shown so many people that in, in my area, it seems like so many people that thread their bobbins that way. And just from watching others over the years, that's how I've always threaded my bobbin. Until one time when I was in the middle of a fly tying demonstration at a fly fishing show, and my thread slipped out of my bobbin, <laughs> I went to you know suck it back through, and it just wouldn't work. And here I am in front of an audience of like 50, and I have a bobbin. The thread's not going through. I don't have a threader. I mean, Marvin, how sad is that? Here I am, I'm a fly tire and doing a professional demonstration, and I don't have a threader on hand. And thankfully, somebody from the audience happened to have one. Because I was trying to make a joke. <laughs> it was like, hey, Tim, you want to borrow this? I'm like, you know what? Let's, let's go with that right now. Because otherwise, I'm going to be tying this with my, the bobbin in my lap. I don't think it's going to go really well. So those are the two that that I don't, you know, I don't use. I, so I apologize for changing your question, Marvin. No, it's all good. It's funny. So that's how I thread my bobbins, which the benefit is you never have to worry about anyone asking to borrow your bobbin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, but I do use a whip finisher, but I can also say that I've done tying classes where everything comes to a crashing stop when you have to show everyone how to whip finish their fly. Oh, that's the worst. Yeah, I, and I feel bad because... Yeah, I, I think back to those days too when you've tied a fly, you have it nearly complete, and just when you think like, "Oh, you're looking at your masterpiece," and then that thread just starts to unravel, and you just see all of your materials going off, and oh, God, that's like the worst feeling in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, shifting gears a little bit, we can talk a little bit more about social media. Um, you know, you've been on YouTube for, I went back as a matter of fact, when I was researching the, uh, for the interview and it's legitimately 10 years, um, which makes you like really an early adopter. Cause you know, 10 years ago before the internet was super fast for a lot of people, it was a lot of work to be on YouTube. It still is. It still is. Yeah. Uh, YouTube is, it, it's a really great platform. Um, I, I love YouTube as much as I still get into some of the other platforms. At the end of the day, that's kind of that's my main one, and and I have to kind of reinvest in my channel because I had to take a little bit of time away while I was writing you know, my fly time book. What got me into it at the beginning um, it was the desire to share. Especially, I had a friend that was on the other side of the country who he went to learn how to tie this fly, and I, you're kind of building me up on on YouTube. But I can tell you, I feel like I'm always the last one to get to whatever the the, the thing is, whatever it is. And I was so scared of YouTube. Like, I didn't know how it worked. I was afraid once I uploaded something, my computer was going to be watching me. I, I just had no idea. So I did this first fly tying uh, video, and I, I uploaded it. It was it was just for my friend. And then it, it kind of went well, and I, I had fun doing it. So I said, we're going to make another one of these, see how it goes. I emailed it to my dad. My dad emailed it to a bunch of his friends. And I kind of forgot about it. So I believe if you look back, maybe my first two videos, which I recommend don't watch those. They're terrible videos compared to my current ones. But those first two videos kind of were on their own. And after so long, I got like a notification. It said something like I had 25 subscribers or something, something like this and 100 views. And I was like, wow, I got 100 views. And at the time, like, that was a really big deal for me. I, I was kind of blown away. Like, people were actually watching this. And I'm like, you know what? Let me make another one and see where this goes. And then I made another one and I kept going from there. And it just kind of escalated to where it is today. And for, for anyone who's out there who's saying, geez, I want to do that too. Like at the time I had zero plan. Like there, there was nothing like I'm going to make these videos and then start writing magazine articles, then write books. I'm going to be a featured presenter around the world. Like none of that stuff was part of the plan. It was just to share fly time videos with others because that was really cool to me. And I know when I got into fly tying early on, there wasn't a lot of information. And it's interesting now because knowing that I was one of the earlier YouTube fly tires to kind of stuck it out, going through those first few years, there were a lot of people that were professional fly fishers and tires that were really not, they were not accepting of it. And a few people, you know, commented back to me, they either called me or they talked to others and, and said, geez, can you see what Tim's doing? He's just giving this stuff away. And I don't think they had any idea that the internet was really about to shift the way that we learned about time flies. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny you say that because that story is very similar to the stories I've heard about uh, how Tim Flagler started um, and that he was really just trying to get files to friends. And he kind of looked, you know, got a notification that a few thousand people had been looking at his videos. 
so loud. Man, it, whenever I tell people now that I have like 25,000 subscribers, like that just is, a, I, I, you have no idea how mind blowing that is. Like I can still remember celebrating like a hundred subscribers, a thousand subscribers, like 10,000 views, a hundred thousand views. Like whenever I hit a million, that was like, I'm done. I'm like, what, where do I, what else can I do? And it, it's cool to see how it just continues to grow and evolve. Yeah, I, I think the neatest thing, I mean, you know, the analog for me is obviously the podcasting stuff, but it's always, you know, it's such a phenomenal tool for finding your people. Right. And and that's what wows me about it is just the people that just, you know, other countries, different parts of the country just reach out and they're like, hey, this I like this or I didn't like this. And to me, that's really the power of the technology. Yeah, well, speaking of that, I'm curious to get your thoughts on this. Whenever I talk about my first videos, like how bad they were, and it's not that they were bad. It's just as you learn more and more about the platform and as I learn more about making videos and you with audio, what stinks about learning that is. Once I learned this about, we'll say, the, the editing of my videos whenever I'm, you know, looking at the lighting. Like, once I've, I've figured that out, I can't go back and do it the wrong way anymore. Because, you know, cause it's kind of like the whole ignorance is bliss. And I think that's what's really been, I don't want to say frustrating with YouTube, but it's something that is definitely, you know, it weighs on my mind. Because once I got my videos to a higher level, they had to stay at that level, which means you put a little bit more time into planning them more time into filming, more time into editing, which means the videos aren't coming out as often as they were before. I, I don't know if you, you, you find a way to connect that to podcasting as well. Yeah. You know, I, I struggle with that. Right. So, um, you know, I'm pretty type a, um, I'm a, I'm a lawyer is my day job. So, uh, you know, I, I try to plan and have, have a pretty kind of like you have a high idea of what I want to put out. I, I would say, you know, what I find fascinating about social media, and I don't have a really good answer, I push myself to ship regularly and not polish the apple too much. But, you know, you sort of see this tension between connection and quality, right? And it doesn't mean that the quality can't be good, but I suspect there's stuff that you and I lose sleep over that no one cares about. <laughs> oh, man, you have no idea. Right. I'm sure or, about that. Right. Yes. Right. And so you, you sit back and, and so I'm always struggling with, um, cause I think the secret to being successful in, in whatever your digital medium is, is consistently showing up. So that's the struggle that I have, right. Um, is trying to, you know, not is to consistently ship and understand that some of the stuff that I get worked up about, no one cares about. Yeah. That's great advice. That's really great advice. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting, but you know, you know, being a one dec a one decade dude on YouTube, you clearly, you know, the, the platform has evolved and I'm sure your approach has too. How have you had to change the way you use the tool? Gosh, uh, that's a really great question. And I, I'm currently really, I'm, I'm attempting to evolve my YouTube channel a little bit. I ran into a snag recently and I think I have a solution. I'm not going to, I won't announce that yet, but Really, what I've been I've been focused on was at the beginning. It was really about education, about information, tying flies, giving their backgrounds, talking about ways to fish them, that type of stuff. I was always, you know, I'm a, a teacher by trade, so I teach right now sixth grade, and I, I knew I could deliver the information, and I could deliver it with some enthusiasm and my passion because to me, I mean, this is what I live, what I breathe, what I love. So I knew I could always do that part of it. The one area that I know it is not quite there, at least when it comes to YouTube and fly tying and even fly fishing, is the entertainment side of it. So that's kind of been my, my approach has always been make sure the information I give is, is solid information. It's information that has worked for me. That, I, that, that At least if, if I put it on my channel, I, I've tied the fly, I've fished the fly, it's caught fish, I've been information on it, or as much information as, as I thought I needed to do, which sometimes isn't enough. But, you know, I try to put a lot of you know, a legwork into all those patterns, into all those flies, into any of my suggestions ahead of time. I mean, if you saw me tie it five years ago, I was fishing that fly five years ago. So I really believe that. But I also understand with a lot of the stuff that I watch too, you, you watch some, some stuff on YouTube, on Instagram, wherever, and it's just putting me to sleep. And I want to make sure that I'm finding that balance, you know, between the information, but also make it a little entertaining for people. And at times, I, I have to watch because I, I tend to be very sarcastic. And I try not to come across that way in my videos. But 
if you, you know, try that approach to entertain others, sometimes it could be taken the wrong way. So that's been, my approach has always been deliver really just solid content, but now I want to make sure my enthusiasm shows through and also bring a smile to people's face. So I hope as my videos continue to move forward, that's kind of the approach that you see within them. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I think the challenge is, you know, we we feel this tension of, you know, what we think we need to do to for however you want to measure it, be successful or impactful. And then you always have that thing like you want to be entertaining, but you want to be in, entertaining in a way where when people meet you in person, they're like that you're not two different people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're right about that. Right. And that was one of the things when I was reading your book that, you know, the, you write the way you talk. Right. Um, which, you know, some people don't. And so, you know, I was like, you know, having seen, you know, knowing you and then seeing you on YouTube, you know, it was Tim and it's Tim's book, right? <laughs> well, I'm a talker on YouTube. I, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I, I, there's definitely people who, who literally just comment. I thought this was a two minute video and it, you talk for eight and a half minutes and, <laughs> and like, that's it. I, I'm Italian. I love to talk for anyone who's ever seen me at a fly time or fly fishing show. And I'm at my tying station. I don't tie. I mean, I'm there to, to meet and connect with others. That's, I guess to me, I really love the notion that YouTube has been able to bring so many people into this smaller world. And whenever I'm out there, like, I, I don't want to be tying a paradigm and have somebody watch it. And, you know, I'm just completely entranced into the fly. Like, that's not what it's all about. It's great whenever people just come up to me, they hear my voice and they're like, I know your voice. It's you. And I'm like, what's your name? And we, you know, we can connect and talk about where they fished recently and the flies that they like to tie because that's what this is all about at the end of the day. It's just really making those connections. And, and it's just so awesome when, when we can kind of put a face to that, to that voice that we've heard, or if it's somebody who's been commenting on my, on my videos for years. I mean, it is just wild. Whenever I was in Denver last, you know, a couple of years ago, and this gentleman, Russell, came up to me, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, you comment. You're the first person to comment on every one of my videos. Like, and I was able to shake his hand. We were just able to BS for a little bit. You know, it, it was awesome. So that, to me, is one of the, 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 the cool factors of YouTube. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about some of the folks that you watch, but, you know, and, and we've touched on, you know, kind of, you know, it's awesome that we get to have all of these voices, but you kind of want a little bit of a – a little bit of curation. So what are your suggestions for tires about how to use social media to up their tying game? Gosh, that's a great question. First of all, what are you trying to get out of it? So if somebody's using social media, what's your purpose? Because I have a, a ton of people that will reach out to me who want to know, like, you know, how can I do this? How can I get more followers? How can I get more subscribers on YouTube? How can I get a sponsorship deal? So I guess what my, my first question back to others is really, what are you trying to get out of this? So whenever, you know, I, I saw your question, it was about, you know, how can tires use social media to up their game? And I also, I, I guess I have to ask, I, I'll ask you to rephrase it. Are we talking about how to improve their flies or how to get to whatever their next level is? Yeah, I, I would say improve their flies. Um, there are only so many problems we can solve at the articulate fly and, you know, turning everybody <laughs> into a social media influencer is probably too much for us to bite off tonight. Okay, perfect. Well, that, and that's what I thought. So here are a few suggestions I have. If you're going to use social media because in my mind, I think social media is a positive. There are definitely a bunch of negatives out there. I ignore them when I see negative comments. I delete them. I mean, that, that part of social media doesn't exist to me. For the positives, uh, for someone who's into social media, first of all, connect with others for feedback. I don't care if you're in a Facebook group, on Instagram, if you're in Twitter, uh, don't be afraid to share a picture of your fly and ask others for feedback. Don't be afraid to send that pattern to somebody that you think wouldn't even answer you and see what they say. I mean, send it to Tim Flagler. See if Tim will give you feedback on it, but be careful. And because and what's tricky about this is whenever people send blind flies to me and they want feedback, I'm not sure if people can handle feedback. So that's, it's kind of a two-headed suggestion. Please connect with others for feedback, but also be careful because sometimes if I see a fly and I, I can't even see the eye of it, my, my first comment is going to be, are you going to fish with this fly or is this just for a you know, display box because we can't get tip it through the eye? So I, I guess there's so many people who want feedback, but, I really try my best to make it constructive for them because I don't want to hurt someone's feelings because to them, that might be the best fly they've ever tied. So 
I really, whenever people ask me for feedback, I, I try to give one positive and one area that they can improve. So when they're connecting with others and they're asking for feedback, try to be specific in what kind of feedback you're looking for. Maybe just say, hey, I tied this for the thorax. Is there another material you think I could have used? Or is there a way that you would recommend that I try next time? So ask people for feedback, but be very specific or detailed about it. Otherwise, I've seen this happen on Facebook where people just lambaste somebody. And it could be a 13-year-old boy who's posted a picture or, you know, or a 14-year-old girl who posted a picture of her fly. And you get a few people who are really, really positive, And you get others who don't realize the individual that posted and just almost go into attack mode, which is not what this is supposed to be about at all. It, it, it's about improving others. So that's what I would say. Have a little confidence. Put that fly out there. And, and listen to the feedback because you're going to get some, some really solid feedback. And if you're afraid of posting it publicly, send it to some individuals and see if they'll give you some private feedback. That would be number one. Um, number two, if you're into trying out macro photography, try to do so. You can buy these little macro lenses for your iPhone or for your, your smartphone that will allow you to, to basically, it, it almost acts like a magnifying glass on your flies. Now, if you can upgrade some photography equipment, or try to find a cheap macro lens and maybe a crop sensor camera, absolutely do it and start to take pictures of your flies. Because whenever you start to see them under the lens, and I learned this kind of the hard way in a sense, you start to realize that you make little mistakes that definitely can influence the fly. Maybe not to the degree that a fish won't eat the fly, but you start to realize that there's a better way to do what you're doing and you can improve your patterns. Sometimes we're just tying, we're caught up in the moment, we're trying to crank out flies with devices because we're going fishing the next morning, that you, you don't care, you're not quite sure about it. But for anyone who truly wants to up their game, I absolutely recommend investing in some type of macro photography so you can really look at your flies throughout the stages and, and make changes and improve them later on. And then finally, um, you know, I, I said earlier in this podcast, be careful what you see on social media because you know, some of the stuff out there may not relate to, to you, but at times get on social media, see what people are tying. And as you look at that stuff, there's no way that you can't just be inspired and, and show more creativity in your own tying. And at times I love to just go onto social media, check out some other patterns and, and think like about it. Jen F. Genny that I mentioned before, like, Oh, he's doing this really cool thing with, you know, a Hungarian partridge feather. How can I integrate that concept? in another style of my flies. So I really just love to, you know, let social media drive new ideas and concepts and then try them out. And sometimes they'll work, sometimes they won't. So, so that's kind of what I love about social media. It definitely can help to improve your, your overall fly time. Yeah, very neat. I always tell people it's kind of funny because you have the the dark side of it. And I always tell people, you know, social media is like a shovel. I can dig a hole or hit you on the head. And so it's really <laughs> it's really up to each of us to use. It's a super powerful tool to do all these great things that you just described. So, Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Yeah. And so, you know, we're recording this at the end of June and at the beginning of July, your first book, Fly Tying for Everyone, is coming out. And um, I've had the privilege of seeing an advanced copy, but uh, why don't you tell folks uh, where you got the idea for the book? Gosh, well, well thanks, Marvin. Um, fly Tying for Everyone was not my idea, so I want to make sure I preface that. My game plan was to you know, teach for X amount of years and then retire, fish all the time, and you know, write a book, kind of like John Garrett style. That was kind of like, in my head, that was the way it was supposed to be. And I ran into Jay Nichols, and I'm... He's the owner of Headwater Books. He used to be the editor of Fly Fishery Magazine. I mean, he's really big in the industry. Uh, I've, I've been in situations with him before in, in tying shows, in fishing situations, and we've even shot sporting clays together. And we just always talked. And, and, you know, I love books. And we've talked books together. And it was nothing more than that. And one day I got this, like, random Facebook message. And it was from Jay. And he was like, hey, Tim, do you know anyone who'd be interested in writing a book on fly tying? And... I stared at this message, Marvin, like I'm thinking to myself, is this a joke? Number one, or did he send this to the wrong person? Cause I, there's no way he's sending this to me. So I like sat on this message for, I don't know how long, because I, I, I was waiting for him to say like, Oh, sorry, wrong person. Or like, try to <laughs> retract. I, I, I didn't, it just, it was that pinch me moment. Yeah. So we, we eventually had a conversation and, um, it, and it kind of centered around the notion of, 
of social media because I love books. I love fly time books. There's not a lot of current ones out there right now. But more importantly, as we talked about 30 years ago, there were few resources out there, but those that were out there, they were vetted. Like you could trust them. You knew that for the most part, like they had been edited. They had gone through the proper sources. And now we, we live in a time where our resources in fly tying and fly fishing nearly appear infinite, but they're not vetted. We don't know if they really work or if it's just a random creation. And at times we don't even know where to look. So Jay and I really agreed on the concept that there's so much out there, but there's not a fly tying book where it, basically if I say you can go on social media right now, if you're into tying flies for trout um, and, and maybe some of the bigger fish, maybe bass and streamer patterns. But if you start watching what you see on social media, my book will help you tie, I don't know, 75, 85, 90% of those patterns. You'll learn the concepts through that book. It's a vetted book. It has a modern approach, though. And that's what we really want to do. Like, and Jay was very clear. He was like, We're, we don't want to write a book that teaches someone how to tie the Adams dry fly. Been there, done that. Maybe too many times. So instead, we want to look at it from kind of a modern approach, modern materials, uh, techniques, keeping all the content in an organized manner that's easy to read, but also valuable information. So that was kind of the, the concept behind everything, if that makes sense. Yeah, it absolutely does make sense. And it's, um, it's interesting because it kind of flows into my next question, which is, you know, who did you write the book for? Because this really isn't your typical tying book. No. Well, listen, come on. It's called Fly Tying for Everyone, Marvin. I wrote it for everyone. That's the title. <laughs> but no, yeah, no, but I mean, uh, but I, I guess well, what no, I, I know where you're going. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess what I mean, you know, just to help people understand is, you know, this isn't, you know, wind the thread away from you and and that sort of stuff. Because I mean, the first pattern you and I were talking before we started recording is, uh, you know, you've, you're doing a dubbing loop with CDC. So I mean, it's not a, you know, first night at the vice type of a thing. No, it, it's not. It's not like a here's step one of fly time, here's step two, here's step three. I would love to say that I wrote this book for beginner, intermediate, and advanced tires because in my mind, there's something for everyone in there. There is. It's not going to take you through step one. Here's how you put thread on a hook. That's, that's not what it does. But I guess as I kind of go through the book in itself, I wanted to start off and I wanted to give an overview of kind of the 21st century fly tying. And that's really what it is. Like what's going on in the 21st century in the world of fly tying? What are some of the most popular vices? What are some of the essential tools? And I kind of, I, I put it in a way that it lists tools that to me are essential, but then there's also other tiers or categories of them. So I tried my best to pull in some modern materials and tools. And then I went into 13 patterns. It took a lot of time to select the, these 13 patterns. It, it was the baker's dozen because I wanted to find a way to, Select flies that were unique, were different from each other, caught fish, but also caught fly tying technique. So I looked at this as if I'm a person who's new to fly tying, but I, I kind of know some of the basics. I know how to get my thread under the hook. I know how to whip finish. And, you know, I can get through that at least initial stuff. And I want to say, like, what's next for me? That's where my book comes in. So it, I hope that kind of helps make sense to people because at the end of the day, I look at this book as a way to reduce the learning curve for both tires and even for fly fishing because I give a lot of fly fishing tips throughout it too. And that was the, that was the toughest kind of piece of information whenever I was first getting into tying was that everything was just so new. There were so many materials out there. There were so many techniques and it was tough to just want to digest them all because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to learn everything today and it's nearly impossible in fly tying. So whenever I put this book together, I wanted to put it together in a way that if you can tie these 13 patterns, you're doing really good. So if for someone who's saying, geez, which one should I tie first? I would scroll through the book and say, if you fly fish already, which fish, which fly do you catch a lot of fish on? Which of these flies look like it? And start to master that one pattern and then expand from that point. Yeah. And I would say too, like I, you know, I think the book is one of those books, you know, to your point that you can come back over your tying career because you're going to get something more out of it every time you tie the pattern. And, um, you know, there were kind of some things that jumped out at me, you know, first of all, I would say folks that, you know, just to get kind of, you know, Tim's honest, um, assessments of gear and, um, and materials is worth the price of admission. But, you know, the, really the neat thing, you know, even more so than kind of the really structured tying tip feature technique materials and how to fish the patterns 
is there are these little tying nuggets in the pictures. And, you know, they remind me of those little nuggets that you pick up when you go like to the fly fishing show and you spend time with the tires and those little tricks that, you know, you could spend months by yourself trying to figure out why you can't get it right. And there's a little <laughs> bold face tip. Like, I mean, I can think about, uh, you know, your first dry fly pattern and you were basically telling people how to keep tension on the material to keep the material on top of the hook uh, so that you didn't end up with a lopsided wing. Right. Um, yeah. And that's just one of those things where, you know, there are lots of different ways to skin the cat, but it's a whole lot easier for you to tell us. And then we can go on and learn something else. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm glad that you noticed those four, those four things, the time tips, the techniques, the fishing suggestions, and materials to consider. I, I kind of thought to myself, if I was going to, if I had a fly time book sitting in front of me, what would I want to get out of that? And I knew it couldn't just be, here's how to tie X dry fly or this Euro nymph or this articulated streamer. It had to be more than that. And I, I knew the step-by-step was going to be critical because I, I, I thought to myself, some people are just simply going to go right to step number one and tie these flies from step one to wherever, wherever the pattern finishes. But I also kind of reflected on my own fly tying videos and YouTube. And within those, once I finished tying a fly on YouTube, I like to talk about, you know, here's a, a time technique that we did. Um, here's something that you could, you know, vary your pattern with. Uh, and also here's how you fish the fly. Because at the end of the day, that's what this is all about. I and mean, what we're tying these patterns, to catch fish on them. So these are fishing flies. So I really wanted to, to make sure that these, these flies cut fish, but also that I told people, hey, here are some ways that I fish these patterns. If it's an emerger, I want to tell you what, what that means whenever I say an emerger, and here's how I fish my emergers. So I really, like you said, I, I felt like I gave a ton of information within those, and I, I hope the readers really kind of are able to, to take it all in and and it makes sense to them as well, because I, and I'm glad that the format, you know, resonated with you. Yeah, absolutely, too. And kind of back to what we were talking about earlier is trying to kind of learn, you know, as opposed to just, you know, spending your entire life memorizing steps to tie flies um, to think about, you know, when you talk about materials to consider and say, well, you know, we use material X because this is the behavior we want. And, you know, maybe you want to tweak it and change the behavior so you can try some other stuff or you know, not all of us live, you know, next to a fly tying emporium, right? And you, you have to substitute, right? And I mean, and, and you know, I can think in my own life where you have, you talk to people and they're like, well, I don't have a TM Co, you know, 5623, so I can't tie this fly. And you're like, well, what is it? And, you know, and it's like a 2X or 3X long nip hook, you know, those types of things. And I think it's really, really valuable to people to kind of break down those barriers um, to help people yeah, tie more, right? Yeah, yeah. I think the, the notion of being able to substitute is really essential. I mean, I, I don't know about you know people who are listening right now, but if I watch a video and it's Lance Egan tying a fly, like I want to use exactly what Lance Egan's used. Like that's me. That's that's my OCD. I I want those exact materials. And if he says that's a good material, I want to buy every color of it. Like that's how I tend to roll. But it's funny because whenever I'm the one tying on YouTube, and I say, oh, we need a peacock dubbing. I have nine different brands of peacock dubbing. I'm going to grab whichever one's closest at the time. But if that's the one that I held up in front of the camera, I start to get emails from fly shops like, hey, Tim, thanks for showing that dubbing. We, it's been flying off our shelves. And, and I, it's just like, that's the one I happened to grab that time. So it, it is funny because I'm the person that when I'm the, the viewer, it's like, tell me everything precisely. And then when I'm the person that's you know recommending it, it's like, hey, it doesn't matter. You can use any of these 16 things. But it, it's funny to kind of look at it from both ends. Yeah, it's funny you say that, right? Because for Lance, you can click on the button and you can literally order every single thing yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. from those guys. Um, but, you know, it's funny too, right? Because when I talk to people that have written books, I'm always curious about the writing and editing experience. And I either get like, I'll never, ever, ever write another book again in my life <laughs> or I'm ready to write another one. And so kind of how did it shake out for you? Well, I'm in the latter camp. Um, I really enjoy the writing part of it. That to me was just, it was awesome. Um, it was really cool just telling the story of the pattern, um, trying to make it, I tried to make it, and I think you mentioned this, I tried to get my voice in there. And I, and I can tell you that I woke up really early in the morning. So this, we're talking like, you know, four thirty, five 5 o'clock in the morning, I made coffee and, and I would, you know, write for an hour every day or an hour every other day. And I, I really had to just get that information out there we'll say just the, the background on the flies or that initial part, or even my acknowledgement. I mean, those were all 
sections that just, they took time. You know, you had to really think about it. I had to have a, a format and, and an organizer for all of that. So the writing part was really, it was really cool. I, I absolutely love that, that aspect of it. Um, and then I guess you also kind of mentioned the notion of the editing too. That was the part that really blew me away because once the book was finally finished, and I mean, I'm telling you, I was just like, it's done. It's, this is great. I'm, I, it's done. I could email it to Jay and it was all on him. And then he, it was so funny because he's like, well, you, you don't have these 25 pictures yet. You get those done by Monday. I'm like, oh gosh. So it wasn't done. So I got those. Then it went to a, you know, a copywriter or a copy editor and that person sent it back to me and they had about 60 questions. So I answered those 60 questions and then it came back and there were 20 more questions. And I, and I had to read it each time because as I was going through this, I knew that each time, even if it was a month from the last time I read it, there would be something new that I would pick up. And going back to like these YouTube videos and, and your podcast, I didn't want to miss anything. So I would read everything from start to finish until I was satisfied and until like we agreed that that's how it should look. So the writing part of it, it was a blast. I love putting the words down. And to be honest with everybody out there, um, since the book's been published, I haven't been able to read it from start to finish. I'm just, I'm nearly afraid to read it, if that makes sense. I mean, I, I think I mentioned I love John Garrick. He's just like my favorite author out there on fly fishing for sure. And I met him one time at one of the fly fishing shows in New Jersey. And I remember he was going to be reading a chapter from his book after lunch. Well, during lunch, I thought, you know, we're eating a burger or something. And I look, and there's John. And he's sitting at a table by himself reading his own book. I thought, this is weird. Like, why is he over there? He's by himself. Like, he has all these fans around him. He's reading his own book. And it just was so weird. And about a half an hour later, he showed up in, the, in this room. I was there with a packed room for him. And he read the chapter. And then we got to ask him some questions afterwards. And he said something that didn't make any sense. And he basically told the audience he really couldn't stand reading his books afterwards because at that point, he'd already moved on to a new book. He'd learned new writing techniques. And it's terrible for him to look back and realize all those mistakes that he made and how that book could have been better if he knew what he knows now. And I thought, come on, John, like you're, you're like, you're an incredible, like award-winning author. Like your book was awesome. Like be proud of it. And now I'm in his shoes and I don't want to look at the book because I'm thinking if I find something that I could have made better for that reader, it's going to kill me. So it, it's been really tricky to like have these copies of the book around me and I skim it every now and then and we'll look at a page. I'll be like, all right, I'm happy with page 27. Like I wonder what page 28 is like, but I just haven't been able to go through it yet. Start to finish. No, I totally get it because you know, God forbid, if you found a a semi a bad semicolon or a misspelled word, you'd lose it. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah, that's for sure. Um, so you know, also I always like to ask authors, you know, kind of the greatest challenge or surprise in the process. Uh, easy, one hundred percent macro photography. Um, I, I, that's why I tell people if you can get into macro photography, it, it will make you a better tire of it. It, it will just, it will, it's just another area of life. Like there's just a, a steep learning curve to photography in general, to video, to audio, to all of that stuff. And macro photography is something that I have never done prior to this book. Um, I took pictures with my, I had an old Canon camera with a crop sensor and just a, whatever the, the lens was on it. I knew nothing about lenses at that time. I took pictures with my cell phone and I was happy with them and life was good. And then I, Jay was telling me about macro photography and I had to start to research that. And geez, talk about like a rabbit hole that just doesn't end. Um, that, that to me was the trickiest part because I knew that with each thread wrap, people could see my previous thread wrap. They could see everything. And it didn't bother me knowing that, but I knew that if I said you make four wraps, I wanted to make sure that if somebody counts my thread, they see just four wraps there. So I had to be very precise in everything that I did because I knew it would be captured in its entirety. And the, the, the one thing that I'm most proud of with this book, every fly from step one to step 20, that's, that's the hook. Like that, that is the fly the whole way through. Like it's not like I tied on one fly these first five steps and I swapped it out and then I put it in this book like it didn't work that way. It was everyone to start to through, which I can tell you that, that that's a challenge because at one point there's a fly in there, the paradigm. Uh, I tied the paradigm the whole way through whatever its final step was. I'm not sure what that number is. And on the paradigm, it's a, this Spanish nymph that is known for a very slender body and it has this very dark wing case black and you could put it on with nail polish or uv resin or even a sharpie well i decided to use this black uv resin for my book it's a newer material i wanted to showcase a new material so i tied this 
this paragon the whole way through. I mean, it looked fantastic. It was just, it looked like a fish would, would find its way to my basement to eat this fly. It was just being tied so well. I was so proud of it. And I got to the last step and I just touched it with the brush and the black wing case just extended past the halfway point. And it's not supposed to. But would it still catch fish? 100%. But it was no longer a presentation quality fly. And that was, to me, that, that was the biggest challenge because it was tricky. I mean, whenever people say, well, how do you write a book? You can't even tie this fly. When I'm writing, when I'm tying these flies, you have a giant camera with a giant lens in front of you. I have these two lights that are flashing. There's strobe lights that are flashing. I have two other lights that are on the other side. I have a, a background. So you're really working in a very confined space. That it's, it's almost not fly tying as you're tying a fly, if that makes sense. So for me, I mean, I remember I finished that fly. I was sick because that was like a half a day thrown away. I had to restart that, that whole pattern. I went upstairs. I was so bugged by it. And that's where, I mean, the person who's really got me through this entire thing, my wife, Heather, she was like, Kim, it's one fly. You can move on from this. Like, you know what you're doing. It was a mistake. Everyone makes them. It was something that was, it was going to happen at some point during this process. You just take a night off and, and get back at it tomorrow night. So she was the one that really kind of pulled me back in this because that macro photography was tough. But man, now that I know it, like it's awesome. And, and I, that's why I recommend it to others. Yeah, there you go. And, you know, was there anything else you kind of learned about yourself going through the entire process? Yeah, I, I mean, what I was surprised was at the beginning of this, when I started to tell people privately that, that I was writing this book, so many people looked at me and, and they just said, what took you so long? And that would really kind of, made me take a step back because even though I've been tying for all these years, I've made these videos, I'm a trained teacher. I had to remind myself that it was me in this book. I was the main event. And at times, I mean, I would research methods to tie certain patterns because like I, I had to find out what, what's the correct way that you tie this fly. And then at the end, I, I, I realized like, and that was at the research point. I threw all that stuff away because it, uh, it wasn't somebody else tying that fly. If you want to see that individual, write this book, well, go get their book. This was, this was my book. And I believed in myself. And, and I want to share with everybody my experiences, the flies that I use, the tying procedures that I use. Just like you said, there's a lot of ways to skin it. I mean, you, you can tie a parachute fly 35 different ways. They're all going to catch fish. In this book, you're going to learn my way. And it's worked for me for all these years, and I know it will work for others. But that doesn't mean it's the only way. So, I kind of learned that throughout this, that gosh, um, the key to my success is just, I, I continue to always push myself with new styles, um, new fish, the new species that I would fish for and the friends that I connected with. So as I finished this book, I kind of looked at this, like this was a celebration of kind of all my knowledge, all of my experiences to that point. And then now to speak on what we previously talked about, since it's been published, like my personal database has just grown considerably, which is why that we love fly fishing and fly time. Like, there's something else now that's kind of pushing me in another direction. So it, that's kind of what I've learned about. I'm not sure how I could sum that up in one word, but that's really what I've learned about myself going through this process. Yeah, no, it's really neat. It's, you know, it's not just a distillation of your journey, but it's basically, you know, this kind of tapestry of all these people that have mentored you along the way. Oh, without a doubt. You have no idea how tough it was to write the acknowledgement, just to rethink the people that have, just come into my life, the people that continue to be in my life, my family, my friends. I mean, some of my initial family members, when I first started posting on YouTube, used to send me text messages like, Tim, you better get a manicure. Your fingernails look terrible on camera. <laughs> like, I mean, hysterical stuff. And, and now to know, like, all of these friends, I mean, I feel so fortunate. Uh, you talked about the notion of, you know, people who, who would write reviews for the book and, and the advanced reviewers, the praise came from Tim Flagler, Devin Olson, George Daniel, Gunnar Bramer, and a legend, Joe Messenger. I mean, I had those five people who said, yes, we would love to write a review for you. Some of them read the book and they wanted it to be a review. Others were like, I don't want to see the book till it comes out. I'm just going to tell about you because I know who you are. And I know that, you know, if, if it's you doing this, you're going to do this job. And that was the part, like whenever I had these people that I looked up to that were like, like yes, like they were just, there was not even a question. Like it was, yes, I'd love to do this. And that's really what, that, that, that's what resonated with me throughout this. Yeah, very, very neat. And so, you know, literally within days, people are going to be able to put their hands on these things. 
where can folks order them? Uh, you know, they're all over the place. I mean, if you're, they're looking for an autograph copy, they can they can buy them from me through com. So especially for, for individuals that living in the United States, that's the easiest way. Um, there's uh, I'm fortunate to have a lot of fans around the world. It's a little bit trickier for me to, to do shipping around the world, but I'm, I am willing to work with people that way. Uh, you can find it on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, uh, Target. I mean, any place that sells books, they're there. Um, fly time for everyone's going to be in a lot of fly shops as well. So there's lots of places. And I can tell you, when I first, I logged into Amazon one day, and I, I was looking for something in fly time, and I typed in fly time, and it was a list of books. I was like, cool, let me look through these books. And I saw my book, and it was before anyone told me it was there. Like, it, I was like, this is, something's wrong. I like took a picture of the screen. I'm like, I can't believe this. My book's on Amazon. It was, it was so wild to see that. So those are some places where you can find it. Very neat. And I'll drop uh, a link to your site and uh, some of the other places in the show notes. And, you know, obviously we're, you know, a few months kind of coming out of the, the COVID darkness. Um, so, you know, you may not be quite as primed to do promotion stuff. I, I had Monty Burke on when his book came out and he's like, I'm doing an all virtual book promotion tour cause I can't go anywhere, but I suspect you're starting to line up events and places you're going to be to promote the, the book. You want to share those with folks? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm happy to it. And it is tricky for me to do some promotions because I am a teacher. So it's tough to take off a day of work to travel somewhere um, because because I am pretty active on social media, people know, my students would say to me, hey, good luck at the Denver fly fishing show. So it, it's pretty obvious where I am at all times, but I can tell you, I plan on going to some of the big shows because you know I'm a regular there and I'm a guest speaker and a featured presenter at most of them. Um, so this year coming up, I'll be at the International Fly Time Symposium. Um, I'm going to, I'm planning on the fly fishing show in Edison and Denver. Um, I have a lot of Trout Unlimited and, and Trout Club events lined up already. Um, for those people who are interested, if you're looking for a speaker, I can speak to this book, High Flies. I also do PowerPoint presentations. Um, I, I do book a lot of public and private events. And because of you know what we've had to go through through the pandemic, I'm able to do that remotely via Zoom. So if there's anyone who's interested in doing that, you can find out all about, all about that stuff um, through my website, which is troutandfeather.com. There's a little you know, there's a little link called speaking. If you click there, you can kind of figure out some ways that you can, we can interact. And also on that page, I have my public schedule. So one thing that I've, I'd love to do in the social media aspect, um, every Monday in through the spring into the early summer, I was live on Instagram at 9 PM. And it's been so cool to connect with people during a live show. So for my book release, I plan on, you know, it, it will be in the wind by the time this, this show airs, but doing a couple live events through YouTube, through Facebook, through Instagram. And I plan on doing a few more of those through the fall as well. Uh, very neat. And do you have any other non-book announcements you want to share with folks? Like I know you've got some pretty sexy trips this summer. Yeah. I mean, I mean, number one, I'm going to Iceland pretty soon. That's going to be a lot of fun. I mean, I do a number of hosted trips and that's my favorite one. We weren't able to go last year and, and those fish are just going berserk right now. So well, I'm hoping to go and catch a few of those. Um, other announcements, I mean, today is the day my daughter just turned one. So that's been just awesome to kind of see her last year. So, so yes, I did write a book through a pandemic and while my wife was pregnant. So you can imagine kind of my life during the last couple of years. And then the only other announcement that I have for, for any of your listeners that have been following me, who have sent me an email or watch any of my YouTube videos, thank you, because that support is unlike anything else. And I truly do appreciate it. Yeah, very neat. And you want to let folks know the best way to kind of follow your adventures at the Vice and on the water uh, on the internet? Yeah, I mean, it's up to them, whatever their favorite platform is. Um, obviously, if they need to contact me, website's the best way, com. But I love social media. You can find me on YouTube. Um, if you search for my name, um, that's probably the best way to find me on YouTube. But you can also find Trout and Feather on Facebook. Uh, I post quite frequently on Instagram occasionally on Twitter and there's another app out there called TikTok. It's like addicting because I can kind of make fun of fly fishing and fly tying through TikTok. So it's kind of a new format for me, but that's another area that I've really had a lot of fun with. Yeah. I was afraid maybe you had joined a K-pop band or something. Um. <laughs> it feels like it at times, but it brings us, I don't know. It's, it goes back to what I said originally. Like this is, sometimes we take this a little too serious. We're just tying flies and catching fish. And there's also an entertaining side of it that I think we miss out on a lot. TikTok brings in that side where it's just 
it's having fun. That's really what it's all about. Yeah, very neat. And I'll drop all that stuff in the show notes. All right. Thank you, Marvin. You bet. And, you know, Tim, I really appreciate you, particularly, you know, on your, you know, your daughter's one, one year birthday to join me this evening and uh, to talk about, uh, you know, your life and fly fishing and fly tying. And we got a chance to chat about your book and I'm looking forward to our paths crossing soon. Uh, thanks, Marvin. And again, just like I said at the top of the show, everything you've been doing with your podcast, blogs, I mean, your fishing reports, it, it, it's phenomenal. And I, I'm not sure if people out there, if you understand like the work that Marvin puts into this to keep the articulate fly going, just the work away from his family. I mean, everything you're doing is just an incredible resource for all of us. So thank you, Marvin. Oh, I super appreciate it. And, you know, thanks again for joining me. Have a great evening, Tim. All right. Thanks. You too. Well, folks. I hope you enjoyed that as much as we enjoyed bringing it to you. Again, if you like the podcast, please tell a friend and please subscribe and leave us a rating and review on the podcast of your choice. Tight lines, everybody.